1 Corinthians chapter 10 today. Very important lesson, I think, from Paul. Something that is very relevant for us, relevant for, for all believers of all time, and a very important concept to take note of. He's going to share that with the Corinthian church today. And uh, I think this is something that we definitely need to look at. I think this is a word for us as a group today. So let's pick it up there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all... All our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted heavenly father we come before your throne today just asking for your grace and mercy that by the power of the holy spirit that this scripture written so many years ago would have fresh meaning for us today help us to look into our lives and see what the application of this truth is for us have your way in our life it's in jesus name and all god's people said Amen. paul compares the israelites crossing of the red sea after leaving egypt to being baptized into something that's an interesting concept that's, that's what baptism really is. It's a symbolic gesture that, that serves as a public proclamation that you are joining a movement or joining into following a leader or you're ex accepting a message that somebody gave. That, that the practice was common before Christianity ever used it. Baptism is something that happened uh, throughout time. This is not a uniquely uh, God-centered thing. We just, uh, just kind of took it and ran with it, um, which is fine. You know, uh, obviously it came before Christ. We had John... The Baptist, um, he obviously used it. Those who were baptized uh, in John's ministry were stating publicly that they agreed with his message that they needed to repent of their sin. That was John's entire message. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And those that accepted that went down to the water and he baptized them into that. It was a public proclamation for everybody to see. There's a cool kind of accountability that comes with that. You're letting everybody else know, hey, this is who I am. This is where I'm going. You've all seen this, so now you have... Um, uh, the ability to, to watch for me. Help me stay on this path. This is where I want to be. And in case I start getting sidetracked, then, then please, I'm asking you to be uh, uh, members of this same family that I'm a part of and, and help me to stay on track. For us and for these Corinthians, baptism was, was, and, it was and is a symbolic um, um, act that, that, that showed that, that we were making a decision to allow ourselves to be put to death. That's, that's what we talk about in the baptism, under the water. Put the old self to death and to be raised a new creation in Christ. That's the meaning that it, that it signifies for us today and it's very important. You know, I think there are those who put too much emphasis on baptism. There are denominations that teach that you're not saved without it. I believe that's incorrect. And I believe there are some who don't think it's a big deal at all. And I think that's incorrect. I think it is a big deal. Why? Because Jesus told us to do it. So it is essential, it's important, it matters. It has meaning, it has relevance, it, it should be done. As with everything that Jesus told us to do. Paul, through attaching this concept uh, of our meaning uh, of it to the Israelites uh, being led out of slavery in Egypt will actually be driving home a really important point. This is supposed to be the mark of someone who has had a, a crossroads experience. We talk about that a lot. People who are at a crossroads and they have a decision to make. Which path will I follow? Who am I going to be? Where am I going? What is my, my destination from this moment forward? Our culture talks about those moments a lot. That's what Paul said is going on here. Uh, this is the mark of somebody who's at that crossroads, somebody who has made the decision to walk a different path forever. Now, how does that correlate to the story here? Think of it this way. The Holy Spirit leads us to an awareness of our sin and our need of a Savior. He leads us to the place where we're confronted with the real danger of understanding what happens if we don't accept Jesus as the Savior and the knowledge that there's no way to be saved unless it's through God, unless He does something supernatural. The, the Holy Spirit drives us to this place where we see danger around us and we realize we can't do anything about it other than allow God to do what he's going to do. That's really the, the entirety of the message of the gospel. He will do that for you. But you have to be in that place where you know you need help to ask 
for help. The Israelites were led out of Egypt by God. Where? Directly to the Red Sea. End of the line. We can't cross here. The army is behind us closing in. A place of real danger where they knew they couldn't save themselves and they're confused. They're wondering what's going on. They realize they're in a predicament they're powerless to do anything about. For us, at that point of realization, we cry out to Jesus for forgiveness and, and uh, forgiveness that leads to the salvation from judgment, from death. And He destroys the power of sin in us and brings us into our new life, our rebirth. That's why it's been called being born again. The Israelites cried out to God there by the Red Sea and He parted the waters. He parted the waters so they could cross. And then what did He do? The army is still pursuing Him. The army closes in, walks out there too, and then what did God do? He brought the waters back together. He drowned the entire army. He slammed the door shut. He did away with the old power that had authority over them. It no longer existed. By His supernatural act, He freed the Israelites from, totally from their former oppression and He welcomed them into this new life of being led by Him. That life on the other side of the Red Sea after the baptism. After they had reached the crossroads and decided to follow God. Very important symbolically when you look at it like that. But don't miss this though. Once the door to their old life slammed shut, once the waters closed, not only did that mean their old master couldn't get to them, it also meant they had no way of going back. They're going to try several times in their weakness to go back. God has slammed the door shut. Not supposed to want to go back to the old life once God gets a hold of you and leads you into something new. Something new had begun for them. There would be difficulties in the new life, of course. But He would be with them. That's the difference. Leading them, protecting them, providing for them. That's absolutely a picture of what we should experience when we come to salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. A new life. That's exciting. New life. Rebirth. Starting over. Blank slate. That's all. Man, that gets you pumped up and excited. Led by, protected by, provided for by God. Yeah, give me some of that. I want that. I will willingly follow you, God, because you have saved me. That's so easy to say. Right there in the moment. We should want the door to our old life to slam shut. We should want it to be like the, the waters of the Red Sea. Where they would close again. Where we couldn't even go back if we wanted to. Who we used to be. The bondage we used to live under. To sin which we've been made free from. We should be so overwhelmed by the, the, the weight being lifted off our shoulders now in this new life that, that when, when we realize that, that the bondage that we were under and to be free from that, that should pr propel us forever toward God, just going wherever He wants us to go. We, we should willingly just be glad to follow Him, fully trusting Him, the one who saved us. And that's what they should have done. But what did the Israelites do with this amazing opportunity? This time of being led by the cloud and the fire. They didn't even have to know where they were going. God said, I'll take care of that. When the cloud moves, move. At night, when you can't see the cloud, there'll be a fire. If the fire moves, follow it. That's a great deal, man. You don't even have to think. Just follow. That's awesome. And you can be assured that you're always exactly where God wants you to be. They had that. As they moved closer and closer to the land, God told them He would give them to possess. This time of being fed every day by manna from heaven. What is manna from heaven? We don't know. The word manna actually means, I don't know. What, it means, what is it? That's what the word manna means. What is it? We still don't know what it was. All we know is that it fell from the sky every night. Every, every morning when they got up, there was food. That's amazing. Had that. They had a time when they were with God there of being strengthened to fight enemies they knew they couldn't overcome by themselves. 
after being baptized into this new God-centered life? What did they do with this amazing opportunity? Go back to Numbers. Chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14, verse 1. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Wow. Wow. They're at another crossroads. And they want to make their own decision. They had seen God's power. They had felt His presence. They had experienced His love for them. They had heard His promise of a homeland where He would establish them as His people and bless them beyond measure. But they still didn't really trust Him. They're not really in. When he speaks, their first thought is, yeah, but. Well, here's the thing. Likewise, many of us continue to do the same thing today. Many of us know full well who we used to be, the track that we were on, where that was leading. We have full knowledge of the gospel. We believe that a life without salvation ends up in hell. And we believe that we cry out to Jesus. He forgives our sins, places us on this new path, makes us a new creation. The old person is put to death. And now we are his and he is ours. Our savior, our comforter, our friend, our healer, our Lord. And yet still, when he says, I say it's best for you if in this situation you do this. And we go, yeah, but that doesn't seem right to me. In this situation, I used to handle it this way. I think I'll try that. I think that would be better for me. Those two words, I think. First, rarely are they true. And second, when they are, it just leads to problems. There are a lot of areas where we would be better served to just go, I quit thinking. Whatever you say, Lord. This is amazing. You say, well, what was their circumstance? Because I've been in some really difficult situations where, man, it just all seemed like there was darkness around me and there was trouble ahead and, and trouble behind. And I was like, man, this isn't worth it. This is no good. At least, at least, at least I used to be at peace before. See, that's a lie. We weren't at peace. But looking in the rearview mirror, maybe it seems like there was some peace to how we used to live. And so maybe we have some sympathy, or at least some empathy, for the Israelites here. What, what horrible tragedy were they facing when they said, okay, who wants to be the new leader? We're going back to Egypt. Let's go back and look. Go back into Numbers 13, just before what we just read. Here is the scene. God has been telling them about the promised land all along. He has been leading them there. He's been protecting them along the way. He's been providing for all their needs along the way. They have gotten close. They are close to the promised land. God tells them at the beginning of chapter 13, back in Numbers, hey, take, take one guy from each tribe, 12 guys, and send them as spies into the land. Now, what was God doing? He knew that, that when they got over there, they were going to see... The, the Amalekites and the Amorites and the Hittites, all the ites that were over there, and they were going to be scared. So he said, send, send some guys over there and let's get a report back about just how awesome this place is. Especially in comparison to the desert we're walking through now. He's been promising this land of milk and honey. He didn't say there'd be no work. He didn't say there'd be no problems. None of that. But the promise is clear. This is going to be awesome. 
and I am going to, I, God said, am going to establish you in this place. Send some guys over there to bring a report back about how awesome this is going to be. So what happened when the guys got back there in chapter 13? Um, let's start in verse 27. When they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. They brought back uh, a, a cluster of grapes so big that it was like held on a stick. And there were two of them were carrying it together. Okay. Um, uh, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. See how much time they give to the negative as opposed to the positive? Their minds were consumed with fear and worry and angst looking at what men had established. I totally forgot that they had God telling them to go in there. You've got to love the faithful God. There ended up being two. Caleb and Joshua. Who were like, yeah, there's some guys in there, but, but we got God, so we're not worried about that. Look at this fruit. Would you look at the size of these grapes? No more manna. Grapes. No more manna stew, manna casserole, manna pot pie, uh, uh, whatever. Grapes, milk, honey, the fruit of the land. This is going to be great. Let's go. But you heard the reaction that I read earlier. They didn't give any heed at all to the, good guy, the, the two good guys with the, the good report. They only heard the negative. And even though they heard the negative, their faith in God should have overcome that. He parted the Red Sea for them to walk through. And yet now they're worried about some guys because they're tall. There's a solemn, heartbroken plea from Moses on the people's behalf. And then there's a reply from God. Back in chapter 14 there. Um, go down to verse 19. Still in Numbers. Moses speaking, Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgotten, forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test now these ten times and have not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. And so, standing there close to the promised land, God is ready to lead them in. They're about to win the lottery. They have the opportunity right in front of them. They reject it. And so without even realizing it, they're at a crossroads where there was only one good answer. 
They chose the bad one, and God turned them around and marched them away from the promised land. Because they did not trust him. That's the only reason. Not because they weren't strong enough to overcome. He knows we're not strong enough to overcome. He's not worried about that because he knows he made a promise. They know he made a promise. They're still worried. They're still operating in the flesh. They're still gauging all of their emotions based on what they see. Not what they know. They make a huge mistake. They have to turn the other direction and wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And God, true to his word, every single one of those that rejected him there that day at that crossroads died out there in the wilderness. That's why it took 40 years. They had to die off before he could take the rest of the group back in. And here's the thing. None of these naysayers who, who had no real faith in God even after everything they had seen, they turned from what was scary to them and what they got in return was the, the rest of their life wandering with no peace and no comfort whatsoever. And so here we are today, 2,000 years after Jesus paid the debt for our sins, and many of us have the same faith problem as these poor Israelites. When pushed to respond to a question, we know how to answer. I trust God completely. I have given my life to God whatever he tells me to do I will do but can we line that up with our actions sometimes we've accepted the salvation we look forward to eternity with the Lord but we just don't let God have his way in what is left of our life here on earth why but did you realize that there's no logic in that whatsoever God is either trustworthy or He's not. If He has the ability and the authority to save us, I think we ought to just trust Him with the rest. It seems like a better plan to me. There's, he's promised us this life walking with Him here on earth where, where as Paul said, man, we're more than overcomers. There's no weapon formed against us shall stand. The scripture says. Greater is he that is in us than he who is in the world. The scripture says. And yet still, all too often when there's pressure or trouble in front of us, what we see is scary instead of leaning in to God and allowing him to handle the situation through us. We decide to take the reins back and pull away from him choosing our way over His, rejecting His provision and His leadership, just like the Israelites. How is that going to work out for us? How has it worked out for us so far? I've got my own scar tissue. I'm sure you do too. And so, we find ourselves wandering, just like the Israelites, with no peace, no evidence of the power of God Almighty in our life, with no testimony to offer anybody else who is struggling. Honestly, a lot of the time, as a, as a pastor, I feel like Joshua and Caleb. I'm not doing it right all the time. I, I, I can tell you, I've got my own scar tissues. I've made my own bad decisions. But I recognize those for exactly what they were. I know God is totally trustworthy. And that is the message I share with you over and over and over. Because I know it to be true. And yet I spend so much of my time in and outside of the church begging people to just trust God. Hey, the situation you're in, that's covered in Scripture. We have that one actually laid out for us. Let's see what God says and do that. beg people 
to do that over and over. I beg them to, to just trust God and to stop listening to the naysayers and the doubters because there's plenty of them out there. Every once in a while you run into one in here. They don't last long. I spend my time begging people to, yeah, I know, I, I see the storm too. I see what you see. I understand. That's a horrific circumstance right in front of you. Here's an idea. Instead of turning and walking away from it, because we have scripture about this circumstance, and it says to handle it this way, please walk right into it. Trust God and walk right into it. He is going to meet you there, and something amazing is going to happen. This is part of your promised land that he intends for you. This is an opportunity for you, not against you. I beg people to stop turning back to the old life, trying to pull that door open and run back through it. I say, no, trust God. He's there. He wants to show Himself strong on your behalf. He knows you can't handle it either. He doesn't expect you to. He wants, to, he wants the opportunity to do something amazing. Let Him. And you will be blessed and a blessing to others. The testimony you're going to have is phenomenal. It's powerful. Don't go back to how you used to deal with problems. Let God do something that you can't even imagine right where you are. And yet so many times when, I, when I'm having those conversations, there's a lot of head nodding. A lot of agreement. Followed almost immediately by an about face that is so fast you can feel the wind. A quick return to the same old self-centered, weak, pathetic, losing patterns of the past that have never worked. And yet the enemy convinces us that there's some comfort in going back to the old thing just because we know what to expect. <laughs> what to expect is failure. Angst and worry and fear. It's never once turned out well for any of the people that have turned back. The only victory stories I have to share from those who have yielded their lives to Jesus. Asking Him what to do and what to say and where to go and how to fight and how to love. They've latched on to that. They trust Him. All the rest of my stories end in worry and fear and a total lack of peace and confidence and ultimately defeat. That's the only place that can go. They never cross the Jordan into the promised land. The land of milk and honey. Where there is peace. And there is comfort. And there is confidence. You know, I'm, I'm an old time hymn guy. I love those songs. There's so much great scripture in them. There's so much great praise in them. I love those songs. And yet, here's a point that they almost always get wrong. If you think back to any of the old hymns that mention crossing over the Jordan, what do they make it out to be? Going to heaven. I looked over Jordan and what did I see? A band of angels coming after me. Swing low, sweet chariot, right? Crossing Jordan into heaven eternal that's not what it means it's actually it, here's the thing if it does mean that then we got problems because if, if heaven is crossing over the jordan then that means it's a place with a lot of enemies and a lot of battles still left to fight and a lot of struggles and a lot of tears my Bible says heaven is none of that. That all that gets resolved before then. 
The Jordan is actually meant to signify that opportunity to enter into a time of facing difficulties with the fullness of the leadership and the power and the provision and the glory of God in your life. The Holy Spirit inside of you. The very place where He longs to provide victory as a blessing to you and as a testimony of Himself so that others can be brought closer to Him. It's that place we are supposed to walk right into after we come to faith in Jesus for salvation. Why is this comparison so important? Why is it significant to to see the similarities between the story of the Israelites after they were led out of Egypt and our lives as believers today? Well, there's two reasons that I can see. One of them is apologetics. You know I love apologetics. Ways to logically explain the validity of Scripture and and all of that. I, I love that stuff. I think it's powerful every time we're made aware that this Bible is a collection of 66 books written by 40 authors in three languages on three continents over 1,500 years and yet the earliest writings are completely in harmony with those written last, and the truth of them is undeniable even today. This scripture of mine is of supernatural origin. That's, that's the only acceptable, honest conclusion. And when I, when I see this story, understanding our spiritual life as it is, and then Paul makes the point of, you know what, this is what was mirrored by the Israelites thousands of years ago way before Jesus was even here. And when I look at his, at his argument for the symbolism there, it just blows my mind. I love it. That's exciting to me. That's something I want to share with people because I want them to trust this book. Another reason though. A little more personal. Those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. We know that's true. We see it in world events all the time. When we read of the trials and the travails of the Israelites from from the moment of of, of this horrible decision forward, it should encourage us not to make the same mistakes they did. That's the purpose of it. This should be an exhortation to us. Hey, don't make the mistakes we made. Don't you tell that to your kids all the time, parents? Hey, I remember when I was in the place where you're at right now, I chose to do this and it ended horribly. You would be better off not to do that. That's what this story is for us. Our loving father is saying, hey, here's what happens if you go that way. I'm not going to stop you. Your call. It's not going to end well for you. You're saved. You're, you're going to be with me forever later. But it's going to be a tough road to hoe getting here. Was that too southern? I'm sorry. <laughs> Paul makes that point to the Corinthians in our text today. Uh, back in 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 7. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Paul says there are many possible traps for the Christian to fall into, and it shouldn't be a surprise to you at all because it's all happened before. So learn all you can from those who have gone before you. We have their diary here. Let's use it to teach us what to do, what to expect. There are a lot of lessons to take just from this story that we've been talking about today. One, if you do it God's way, it probably won't take nearly as long or hurt nearly as bad to get where you're going. Israelites were, I've heard the estimates from two weeks to a month to two months walk. I don't know exactly. I don't know how long it takes to to walk to two million people somewhere. Let's go with the long version. Let's say, two, let's say it takes two months to walk to the promised land from Egypt, from the Red Sea. It's a better plan. 
than rejecting God and having to walk in the desert 40 years so that your kids can eventually make it to the promised land. Another lesson, even though a new life has begun, that doesn't mean that the old pull of fleshly desires magically disappears. It has to be starved on purpose. It's a big mistake a lot of new believers make. Okay, I'm a new creation. I'm not that old guy. Um, I'm not going to have to worry about any of that old junk anymore. I'm not going to feel a pull that direction. That is not true. The best you can do is try to starve it to death. And you have to choose to do that on purpose. God will help you. He will always answer that prayer. But you have to make the choice. That's your crossroads. Another thing, no matter how bad things look, if you really need something, God will provide it one way or another. How many times did the Israelites uh, complain when they were wandering that they were about to starve or they were about to thirst to death or whatever? Did God not always provide something for them? Yes. Will he not always provide for what you need? Maybe not what you want. Not guaranteed that. But you will have what you need if you trust him, if you have faith in him. Another thing to learn, there are consequences for not trusting God. He will not force his blessings on those that don't want them. That's bad news for us sometimes. But it's true. If you really want to do it your way, he'll let you. Let me know how that works out for you. If God says there's a promised land and he's leading you there and that there are going to be fights to be, to be had in acquiring it and it's not all going to be uh, peaches and cream. There's going to be some difficult things, some hard things. You're going to have to do some work and it's going to hurt some, but I'm taking you to the promised land and you will take possession of it. Just go. think don't reason just go and you can insert all the promises God ever made to his people right here whatever scripture says he has promised for you assume that you already have it and just go trust him Another lesson, when there are conflicting reports and differences of opinion and the advice that you're getting from others, trust the guys who think God can handle anything. The other guys, don't even listen to them. You don't have to be ugly. You don't have to be nasty. You don't even have to tell them you're not listening to them. You can let them ramble if you want. Don't listen to the guys that don't have faith themselves. Shocker, they're not going to help build your faith. It matters who you hang out with. It matters who you get advice from. Don't ever listen to the naysayers. They will lead you to misery, the same place they are. It's the only place they know how to get to. It's the only place they can lead you. Paul lists a few of the situations where the Israelites made poor choices leading to God having to discipline them. So you can find all those stories. Those are all specific references. We're not going to go into all those today. But you can find those stories, times of temptation where they had a clear choice to make and they chose their own way instead of His. Why is that important to know? Because verse 11 now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it again first just learn from the mistakes of others everyone has endured temptations everyone has endured the temptation that is a stumbling block for you it is not new it has existed since the beginning of time you're not the only one that struggles with that and you can find the stories of victory over it so that god can build faith in you to trust him 
Everybody endures temptation because everybody is still residing in the same old flesh that still wants what it wants when it wants it. That will not change until we're resurrected with glorified bodies, which is coming. That time is coming. Look forward to that, but don't give up until you get there. Here's the thing, though. If you want to have victory over the temptation, it's always available. Scripture says it. With every temptation, he makes a way of escape. Every temptation is a crossroads where we are allowed to make a decision. We have to lose this concept of of powerlessness in the face of temptation. That's always been my struggle. It's so strong in me. I just can't fight back today. Yeah, you don't have the ability. But you have God. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's not about you overcoming. It's about you choosing that you want to overcome it or get away from it, flee from it, whatever the situation is. And as soon as you flip that switch and say, yes, that's what I actually want, is to not fail in that today, then God sends in the army, man. wipes out the enemy that's in front of you. He parts the Red Sea so you can walk across it and then he closes it in on the one trying to trap you. That's what he does. You need to have faith in that. You need to trust that. Protect yourself from temptations as much as you can. Absolutely. That's just good common sense. The danger of listening to the voice of the tempter and the subtlety by which he accomplishes his will in your life. Which again, he can't make you do anything. Go read James. It, it talks about sin very well. It explains that all sin that we, that we actually fall into is something that started in our head. It was, a, it was something in our heart. It was a desire of ours. And we played with it. We thought about it. We rolled it around in our head. And then the opportunity showed up for it to happen. This, this is illustrated by... There's this... Um, picture in the Manchester Art Gallery entitled Eve by this guy name is Spencer Stanhope okay in it he represents the serpent whispering in Eve's ear while she listening plays with the sin within her mind at the same time that she is rolling it over in her mind and thinking about it and wondering and logically looking at it and checking it out considering all her options while she's doing that in her mind in the picture it shows Satan bending down the branch of the tree and then shaking it and the apple falls off of it into her hand. That's that's powerful, I think. If you're going to meditate on something, if you're going to roll something around in your mind, if you're going to contemplate doing something, if you're going to consider your options, let it be something godly, not something ungodly. That is a choice that we get to make. That's a choice we have to make every day. Several times every day. Now, I've seen the opposite of the example of the painting happen so many times. It's just as true. When immersed in the idea of serving others or knowing God more deeply or being stronger in my spiritual walk, that the opportunity for just such a thing drops into my hand. And I get those stories from you guys all the time. I love that. It happens a lot. Almost every week somebody comes in, man, this has really been on my mind and I've been praying about this and, and wondering, hey, is this something that, that I could do? It, it, is this something that I have time to do? Is this something God would let me do? And then magically, coincidentally, it just dro- the opportunity just shows up. It never happened before. I never really thought about this before. Now that I'm thinking about it, there's an opportunity. I think that's true whether you're talking about sin or whether you're talking about following God. What does the Bible tell us about the devil? He's wandering back and forth like a lion, man. He's pacing like a lion waiting on dinner. He's just looking for the one 
that's a little separated from the herd, that's a little slower that day, that's, that's not quite paying attention that day. And that's who he pounces on. That person is the one who is like Eve. Yeah, God said I couldn't have that, but I don't really see the issue. It's just fruit. I don't see where it's that big a deal. I still follow him in everything else. That looks really good. Just, just, just consumed by thinking about that thing that you're not supposed to have. And so what does God do? He allows the test. He will give you what you really want. So make sure you want the right stuff. Protect yourself as much as you can. Don't hang out in dangerous places thinking that you're strong enough to handle the influence of the place or the people or the situation. I've got this. The Bible says, right? That's a paraphrase. The Bible says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. The very moment that what you're consumed by is this idea that that's not a problem for you anymore, that you can handle that, you can be with those people in that place while they're doing that thing, and it's not going to bother you, it's not even going to be a temptation, you're done with that. Bloop. It's going to drop right in your hand. So why not just avoid that altogether? Don't ever forget that Solomon ended up yielding to the temptation to worship at the altars of other gods simply because he allowed those altars to exist. Don't ever set yourself up like that on purpose. Don't play around with evil influences. It's dangerous. More on that next week as we finish the chapter next week. Paul's going to continue hammering this home. He's going to take us back to the meat market situation and use that as his example next week learn this from the israelites who wandered in the desert that 40 years it's not a big area if you can walk there let's say two months i don't know if you can walk there in two months then in the 40 years that they wandered sometimes they were close to the promised land sometimes they were close to egypt sometimes they were in the middle of nowhere it was all pointless. They couldn't get to what God had for them. And they couldn't go back to who they used to be. And they had no power. They had no hope. They had no peace. They had no comfort. Even though God had saved them from the old enemy. In our context, sin no longer has, has dominion over us. If you have reached that place where you put your faith and trust in Jesus alone for salvation and you confessed Him as Lord and you have confessed that He died and rose again uh, on your behalf to pay for your sin, you are saved. Okay? I'm not talking about, hey, you're not going to make it to heaven. You're going to make it to heaven. But why not have this better experience while you're still here? Why not let Him do things in your life? Let, let Him confront the enemies in front of you so that, so that you can be blessed, so that you can have the stories to share with others. Oh, yeah, that happened to me. Check this out. This is what God did. That's the promised land. It's still the promised land. God promised them a place where they could go and with His presence and His leadership, they would overtake the others who had dominion in that land. That's what He's promised us. No weapon formed against us shall stand. Greater is He is in us than He is in the world. I will never leave you or forsake you, He said. But God doesn't change. He's still looking for faith. He's looking for people that want to believe, that want to trust Him. And the cool thing is, even if you feel like you're not there yet, let that be what you want. Let that be the desire of your heart because, because we know that faith in and of itself is a spiritual gift. You can't create it. You can't make it any bigger than it is, but you can want it. As Paul said, earnestly desire the best gifts. That's, that's the best one. Faith. 
think if you really want it, He's going to give it to you. You're going to be amazed at what He does in your life. Amen? Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for Paul's testimony. I thank You for His reminding us to go back and look at history so that we can protect ourselves um, and make better choices than those who have gone before us. This is exactly what we do with our children, exactly what our parents did with us. Well, we all want better for those that are coming along behind us. Let us take this in today and use this. We have this, this recorded history of the Israelites and everything that they did. And so often we waste our time just denouncing them. How could they have done that? What were they thinking? What's going on? We don't take the time to make the correlation to us today. We, we are still entrapped by the same temptations, the same uh, lack of faith so many times, the same pitfalls today. Let us, let us appreciate the fact that we have that written record and not use it to trounce on them, but let's see what we can learn from it. When tempted by this kind of temptation, here are the possible choices. What happened when the Israelites made the right choice or the wrong choice. Let us learn from that. Apply it to our lives. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit to overflowing today, that we would have uh, an, a fresh understanding of the, this concept of the life that you have prepared for us, that you have promised us after we come to the, to the saving knowledge of your grace, that we would, uh, that we would live a, a life on a higher level than, than where we are sometimes. Not only looking forward to heaven we look forward to eternity with all joy and gladness we can't wait and yet here we are waiting because of your timing so so let us get the most that we can out of this time that we have now let us be at peace let us have joy let us rise above circumstances let us be light and salt let us be overcomers and, and more than overcomers let, it, let us be your people shining city on a hill that, 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 that draws people in. Let us lift you up, Jesus, that you would draw others to you through us. Have your way in our life. We, we long to trust you with that kind of faith. Give us that, Lord. We're weak and we stumble. And there are plenty of naysayers out there and the enemy is always whispering in our ear. Give us wisdom and discernment as to who to even listen to in the first place. And give us strength to make the tough choices and walk into the storm when that's what you are telling us to do. That's the bottom line. It's all about your leadership. If you tell us to run from a storm, let us run. If you tell us to confront it because you are going to provide victory there that day, let us not, not even think about it anymore. Just take off walking right into it. Lord, have your way in our life. Lead us, protect us, provide for us just like you did for the Israelites then, just like you have been doing for your people ever since and always will. It's in Jesus' holy Precious, powerful name and all God's people said. Amen. Love y'all.